Equal access to justice is a core American value. In each episode of Talk Justice, an LSC podcast, we will explore ways to expand access to justice and illustrate why it is important to the legal community, businesses, government, and the general public. Talk Justice is sponsored by the Leaders Council of the Legal Services Corporation. I just utterly reject the notion that these individuals are providing second-rate services um, and think it's a lot of hubris on behalf of attorneys to make that claim. Welcome to Talk Justice, a Legal Services Corporation podcast. I'm Jim Sandman, President Emeritus of the Legal Services Corporation and a member of the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Today's program is about how regulatory reform can improve access to justice. We have an all-star panel to guide us through the subject. We have Professor Bill Henderson, the Stephen F. Miller Professor of Law at the University of Indiana Moorer School of Law. He's an expert on the empirical analysis of the legal profession. We have Justice Dino Homonis from the Utah Supreme Court. Justice Homonis has been a member of the court since 2015. Prior to that, he was a trial judge in Utah for more than 10 years. And prior to that, he was a litigator for 15 years. We have Vice Chief Justice Ann Scott Timmer of the Arizona Supreme Court. Justice Timmer has been on the Arizona Supreme Court since 2012. Prior to that, from 2000 to 2012, she was on the Arizona Court of Appeals, including three years as Chief Judge. She chairs the Arizona Supreme Court's Legal Services Task Force. And we have Rohan Pavaluri, who is the CEO and co-founder of Upsolve, an online service which helps low-income families file for bankruptcy for free. Rohan is not a lawyer. He is a graduate of Harvard College, where he majored in statistics. Before we get started, just uh, a few numbers to lay out uh, the scope of the problem that underlies our discussion today. There is a crisis in access to civil justice in the United States today. The National Center for State Courts estimates that in 76% of civil cases in state courts today, at least one party does not have a lawyer. That number does not include family law cases. If it did, the percentage would be even higher. Three years ago, the Legal Services Corporation conducted a justice gap study, which found that 86% of the civil legal needs of low-income people either get no assistance or inadequate assistance. That's the background for our discussion today. I'd like to begin by asking Bill Henderson to set the stage for us by reviewing his research on the market for legal services to explain the causes of so much unmet legal need and to describe the relationship between the current regulatory system and the dysfunction in the market. Thanks, Jim. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to join this illustrious uh, panel, and I hope we could have a wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, uh, I think that the, a good way to set the stage is, is to recall some of the work that I did for the uh, uh, State Bar of California. I was asked to produce a landscape report uh, in anticipation of possible regulatory changes by their uh, uh, board of trustees. And I think one of the principal, I think the principal uh, uh, takeaway from that report was what I call lagging legal uh, productivity. So, uh, and, and, and I'm connecting the legal market to what's going on in healthcare, what's going on in higher ed, and what's going on in government services. You take any kind of very human intensive, labor intensive, knowledge intensive type of activity, uh, and, you, and, you, and you put that parallel to say manufacturing or technology or foodstuffs or textiles, and you, you'll see a cost relationship where the, where the, where the, where the, where the actual real cost of products uh, is going down, things that are manufactured, produced, uh, and that, uh, and that in, in knowledge intensive, labor intensive services going up as a relative percentage of income. So as a result, as a, any typical person's income will go up uh, over a period of time here, but more and more of our wallet share goes to send our kids to college or to pay for our health care 
or to uh, taxes for the government to pay for government services, or uh, in theory anyway, uh, legal services. But one of the things that we know about uh, the, uh, the legal services market through government data is while we were very price inelastic for things like healthcare and things like uh, college education, and we have no choice when it comes to our taxes, uh, the actual wallet share of, uh, of legal services going down over uh, time. And so if you look at the Census Bureau uh, data, we would use to the typical consumer uh, and the consumer price index would spend about 45 cents out of every $100 on legal services. And this would be things like a family law dispute or conveying property or something that fell into the legal services uh, a bucket. And over a period of about 25 years, it's down to a quarter which means is, is, the, is, the, is, is that your typical consumers living in their society, uh, uh, they have to make choices and trade-offs. And one of the trade-offs we're making is like, we're gonna go it alone without legal services. Now, some of that is being, uh, is being um, and at the same time, we know the cost of legal services going up. So uh, legal services, the cost of legal services to hire a lawyer in the, in the consumer domain is, is I, I believe that the, the CPI index, and I've written about this on Legal Evolution, my online publication, has gone up, uh, and it's in the California report here, is uh, it's like 300% since, say, 1987, uh, where the, the CPI has gone up 200%. So real increases in the cost of legal uh, services. And, and, and this means that people are going it alone. So, uh, so one way this has gotten backfilled would be, would be Things like legal zoom where you can you can take an off-the-shelf product and you could plug it in in, in, in lieu of hiring a, a lawyer but one thing we do know from other data sources is that people are just going out with legal services uh, uh, in particular now jim you started this segment by pointing out that three out of every four cases in state courts are have self-represented uh, uh, litigants now uh, the typical and that comes from the national uh, state Court, uh, the National Conference for State Courts uh, Landscape Study. Uh, and uh, that particular uh, 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 data point is, is the, uh, is th those are cases that resolved in a, 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 a 1 million cases over a one year period that resolved, uh, that, that were dispensed with, came to a closure. And a quarter of those ended up in non-zero judgments. And so that there was some sort of a adjudication where the, where the, where the litigants uh, uh, one side had to convey the other side of uh, money. And the, and the median amount was 2,400 bucks. How are we gonna get out of bed in the morning as a lawyer and, uh, and, 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 and write pleadings and responsive pleadings for a controversy that's worth $2,400? And this is explains why there's massive amounts of pro se uh, 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 litigation, self private litigation. So I wanna answer the question, the structural problem. Uh, that, that works against this backdrop of lag in legal productivity. I mean, legal services to hire lawyers going up, the controversies, uh, the amount of controversies are relatively small and to engage the, the, the legal system, it's just not worth the candle. And so, uh, and so, uh, and, and so if I would, if I wanna say the regulatory system, I'm gonna make a little move here that maybe Justice Timmer and Justice uh, Jimenez wanna comment on. And that's, we gotta break this in two. Yes, the, the rules for, uh, for regulatory rules that keep non-lawyers from, from owning chairs in law firms, we have to think about changing that uh, because that will enable the advent of what, we, what some of us refer to as one-to-many legal solutions. We can bring technology and process. And this is actually what Rohan's company does. So you bring data, process, and technology, and you, and you speed up the delivery of legal services. And that's a really good example. Rohan's the CEO of a nonprofit uh, company that, that, that engages in the practice of law. I think that that's, that's okay under the legal services or on, under, under the ethics uh, uh, rules. So we need to let in allied professionals through changing the regulatory structure, but we need to change the actual way disputes are, 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 are resolved. And so in the California report, I spent about a page and a half talking about the advent of online dispute resolution because we have pretty good evidence now that we can design dispute resolutions where, 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 where parties get very good outcomes or satisfied with the process, they think it's fair, uh, but neither side needs a lawyer because there's a case manager that sits on the top of it and there's actually a, a, a well-designed processes that facilitate amicable resolutions of matters so that most of the stuff doesn't need to get adjudicated. 
And that redesign, which I know is going on in Utah, actually Utah, uh, the sandbox gets all the attention, but, but, but uh, uh, Judge Jimenez should talk about online dispute resolution taking place. That is a key part of access to justice. So we can change the rule 5.4, we can change judge authorized practice of law, that will help. We can have uh, uh, you know, a, a, a limited license, legal technicians, that will all help. But redesigning how we, how we resolve disputes and engineering out expensive lawyers with expensive pleading processes, that is a real key, in my opinion, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, access to justice. And I wanna say one thing before I end my, my monologue uh, here. We have the technology to do this. We actually have, uh, we, we can actually in our eyesights to do it. The real problem is a problem of change and, uh, and getting human beings to kind of move in a direction that they're very uncomfortable with here. Uh, there's an old saying in change management it comes from a book said, who moved my cheese? And uh, this is gonna move a lot, of, this moves a lot of people's uh, cheese around changes, power, dynamics and hierarchies. And so if we have the ability to kind of drag our feet we do do that, but the, the technology is there to make this world uh, much more accessible to your typical for your, your typical person to get access to justice here. Uh, but we need to come up with some business models and we need to come up with some transition strategies to make this thing possible. I mean, the technology is there, the process design principles are there. Uh, uh, we have to get institutions and people to cooperate with one another. And that's a complicated job. Thank you, Bill. Well, you make, you make an important point. Regulatory reform by itself is not enough. We look, we need to look to simplifying processes. Yes. They're too complicated, uh, very difficult for people who don't have legal training or access to legal assistance to make any sense of. Uh, but that requires change. Somebody's got to own that. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to figure out what the new processes yeah. look like and get courts and litigants yeah. to adopt them. I got. I can't resist this temptation here. Just to just to to say that Justice Jimenez and and Justice Timmer they have the ruby red slippers to make this possible here because the courts regulate the the the, the right. legal system in our country. Well, thank you for that transition. Uh, we often talk about law as a self-regulated profession, but the fact is that the highest courts of the states actually regulate the professions. They often delegate significant portions of that responsibility to members of the bar, but it's the courts uh, that ultimately have the authority. And we have with us two justices of state Supreme Courts that have been particularly innovative and active in regulatory reform. Uh, both states, Utah and Arizona, within the past month have adopted very significant changes in their rules of professional conduct to permit fee sharing uh, with non-lawyers under certain circumstances, uh, to permit non-lawyer ownership of law firms, and both uh, states now have uh, the possibility of licensing paraprofessionals. Uh, who would be able to provide legal services and in some cases go into court uh, to represent a person with a matter before a court. So I'd like to uh, ask uh, first Justice Timmer and then Justice Timonis uh, to describe what the incentives were to change the regulatory systems in your states. Why did you do this? How did it come about? And can you give us an overview of the changes you've made and why you think those changes will improve access to justice. Justice Timmer? Uh, well, it came about for the reasons that, that Bill has mentioned. And before we even knew a lot of these statistics, which he later related to us at our task force proceedings, uh, we, we knew that things weren't working. And really this came about from just a simple discussion between our then Chief Justice Scott Bales and myself at, at a seminar where we had some of this information presented, it was nothing new. We all know that we have been chipping away at the problem, almost like you would en en envision chipping away at a block of ice. You can get lawyers to give pro bono assistance. You can um, uh, make the self-help centers uh, a reality. You can have online dispute resolution, which we now have as well. But uh, still, people, people are wanting that legal assistance. So Scott and I simply discussed saying, you know, we're, the, we're two of the people on the court that can really make this happen. So why not push forward with 
with really looking at this from a, a regulatory standpoint of are our rules, our ethical rules, which as Bill will tell you, define our market, are they getting in the way? Is it necessary to protect the public to have uh, some of these rules in place? Is it time for a new tier of legal provider? Uh, and other questions. So from that, uh, Scott Dales had decided, well, let's form a task force. And, and I asked to be able to chair that because to me, this would be extraordinarily gratifying to really tackle this, this issue and see if something can be done. That's the great part about being on the court is that you can see something, you can actually do something, at least push for, for examination and real um, discussion about whether changes should be made. So our time for, that was the reason for the task force in typical Scott Bales fashion, uh, if you know him, he gave us nine months to do our work, which is not much time at all. So we met from January to about uh, September uh, finishing with an October report and had a wide variety of folks from uh, both lawyers, non-lawyers, judges, uh, people from the medical profession and others to be able to weigh in, made it a very public process as much as we could. Uh, we ended up with, um, oh, and we also went out and got uh, town halls with, with just, again, non-lawyers to get, to get the public's perspective on what does the public want and are we delivering on that? Uh, also having a polls and, and such done by pollsters to, to see. So as a result of all of that, we came to 10 recommendations and the two that uh, are the largest, are the biggest recommendations are to simply eliminate ER 5.4, which is the ethical rule that prohibits fee sharing and to um, I'll have a new tier of legal service provider, which we're calling legal paraprofessionals who will be able to offer legal advice and to go into court on some occasions. The idea being for the latter to look for the sweet spot where you're not finding lawyers or you're finding maybe lawyers are out there, but it's too expensive for ordinary people, not only low income, but mid middle income people to be able to afford. Um, so that was the idea with the paraprofessionals that we would identify those subject matter areas make them part of the bar, test them, license them, character and fitness, all of that, just as you would do with a lawyer, really, uh, and, and make them available in, in those areas, which I can get into in a bit, which areas we select, we've selected so far. Uh, on the alternative business structures, which we call ABS, uh, if you want to be an alternative business structure, so it's something like Rodan's doing, then you make application to the court. We have a committee that that goes through that. Um, there are certain rules up that, that, that you, can't, you, you can't be an equity owner, for example, if you're a disbarred lawyer, suspended, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and the court will uh, allow you to do that. Now, to, but what you do is you submit yourself to the court's regu regulatory scheme. So right now we regulate lawyers, not law firms. But if you're going to be an ABS, we're going to regulate you, the entity. So there's a code of conduct that, that we've created there. So there are ethical rules. There's a disciplinary structure. They're part of the bar, uh, the bar uh, association as well. If there's uh, disciplinary issues, you go through the disciplinary process that will impact not only the lawyers in the firm, but the, but the firm or, or the entity itself with um, anything from you lose your certification to monetary sanctions which sometimes uh, are all that firms might respond to. So that in a nutshell is what we've done with the, uh, the hopes that this will do more than chip away at that big block of ice as I imagine it, but simply remove that uh, and, and see how people like Ryan can innovate and come up with new ways to deliver legal representation to everyone in our society rather than just people who can afford to pay the big bucks for it. Thank you, Justice uh, Timmer. I have a few follow-up questions. I'm curious about the process that you follow to get public input into your proposals. Typically, when proposed changes to the ethics rules, the rules of professional conduct are being considered in a state, it's kind of a closed matter. It happens in the private councils of the bar. 
uh, there, there may be technically a way for the public to participate because a notice might be posted on the bar's website, but I'd ask myself what member of the public is trolling around on a bar website looking for opportunities to comment. My reaction would be if they are, they might want to get a life. Uh, but you uh, engaged in a lot of outreach. I, I mean, often when issues about proposed regulatory changes implicate protection of the public, we look to lawyers to speak for the public on what is necessary to protect them rather than going to the public directly and asking them to speak for themselves. You gave the public a chance to participate. Can you tell us how you did that and why you thought that was important? Well, one, the, uh, to start with, our culture is a little bit different than what you described. We do everything in public. So our, any rules that, that um, <laughs> any rules that are uh, petitions that are filed and are passed upon by the court is, is, is a public process. So it, we have a, a, our paradigm is you file a rule petition, anybody can file one. In a January of a year, we have an open then rules forum for anyone that wishes to comment, can comment. Um, and, they, and they do, it, it is, as you can guess, mostly lawyers. Uh, and then it, the court will vote on that in August of the year. And so every, we've always had a lot of comment. Almost all, every committee that these rules are, are vetted through have non-lawyers on them. Arizona, we have about 2,000 non-lawyer volunteers that make our court system go. And we're very big on having non-lawyers in all of our, every committee, including the Judicial Council, which is the one that advises the Supreme Court. So we come from things already with, with an eye towards we want public input. But even with all that said and done, as you say, uh, many people don't just, there's always a few, but not a lot that are just trolling to see, well, what can I comment for, for rules? So this is one that we tried to take it to the community and affirmatively solicit commentary. So to do that, we engaged the Arizona Town Hall to have a town hall sessions to bring in people to run these ideas by them. What do you think? Is there a need? That kind of thing. Um, and got their feedback. We also engaged a, a firm called High Ground, which is a professional uh, pollster, among other things, and government relations firm that went statewide in Arizona and conducted a poll from what they tell me, for you statistics people like Rohan, of, uh, was a, a statistically relevant, relevant representation of, the Ari of Arizona, all Arizonans to get their viewpoint on the need for uh, additional legal help uh, for both uh, a new tier of uh, paraprofessional and interestingly, the, uh, a new alternative business structure. I wasn't sure about the latter, how can people understand that in a poll, but the way they did it was to set the stage for them and then ask questions about it. And overwhelmingly, the public favors some, uh, something being done and that both of these were, were good ideas. So we, we did what we can. It's difficult to get the headlines uh, over pandemics and presidential elections and all those kinds of things. So we haven't gotten that kind of media but we've also affirmatively gone out, at least I have, in, in talking to groups. And I'm sure Dino is going to say the same thing of, of, of being out there talking to lawyers, talking to non-lawyers, asking for that kind of input. So that's the way we did it. Uh, it it's still not a, a mass blanketing of, of non-lawyers because it's difficult to get people's attention. But um, that word trickles through and people start weighing in. Uh, one more question before I turn to Justice Simonis. I think it's um, pretty apparent how licensing paraprofessionals to assist people can improve access to justice. Licensing paraprofessionals offers the opportunity to provide some assistance to people who currently uh, may not have access to a lawyer and have no help of any kind. So this supplements the category of helpers who are uh, available to people. Less obvious to me is how uh, ABS, alternative business structures, that is permitting non-lawyers to own law firms or legal services providers, why that might improve access to justice. Could you connect the dots here and explain what the hope is uh, for 
permitting non-lawyers to own legal services providers for improving access to justice and how you explain that to the public in a way that caused them to see that as a good thing? Part of it I can't answer because I don't know how um, innovative people might come up with ways that I can't even envision of how they might serve an underserved population. My general belief in this country is that you, if you see a market that can be served, somebody's going to figure out a way to serve it. And so if you take off some of the constraints that are unnecessary to protect the public and allow people to innovate without a lot of overbearing regulations around that, people will come up with a, with a way to do that. We in Arizona in particular, um, outside of the Phoenix and Tucson areas, uh, we have vast swaths of land where, where very few people live who need, need assistance. So for example, one of our, large, our largest county, Mojave County, bigger than some of the states back east, uh, has six attorneys who can do civil work. That's it. So and I, the idea of trying to not only have a pair of professionals that can be physically there, uh, you would hope that you could have uh, certainly a um, influx of money to allow firms to build up their uh, techno technology abilities to reach people that way. Uh, but some of the some of the folks don't even have decent Wi-Fi access uh, in some of these counties, particularly as you approach some of the Indian reservations and such. So the idea is it's not just an influx of money and not equity owners for technology, but just for people of different skill sets to come together. A very good example is during the, the recession that we just had about 10 years ago, we had a number of attorneys approach asking the bar at least, may we partner with an attorney, a real estate agent and a, and a broker. Uh, some to, to advise people on taking advantage of short sales or what to do with foreclosures or these types of things. And the answer, of course, had to be no, you can't do that because you can't share fees. But perhaps from a consumer standpoint, wouldn't they have been better served if you could have experts in niche areas be able to advise people, uh, one-stop shopping, if you will, on how to, put, how to um, solve whatever legal problem that you have which overflows maybe into non-legal issues. I see. So if I could summarize, uh, I, I, I try to put it this way. Uh, you've seen evidence, proof really, of a dysfunctional market in huge unmet need. Something's wrong. And uh, you're trying to come at that problem by eliminating uh, what you have concluded are unnecessary restrictions on access to capital and who can participate in this market that is currently not functioning well. Uh, it is subject to regulation because, as you said, an alternative um, business structure needs to be approved, uh, ha has to get okayed. So you're going to be scrutinizing it, not just, uh, it's not just, um, if I might say, the Wild West, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and see what happens uh, to see whether we can't do better under a new system than the current system, which obviously leaves so many people uh, without service. Is that, is that, a good, is that accurate? Jim, it's, you said it better than I did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind. Thank you. So, uh, Justice Simonis, can you tell us uh, where the incentives for change in Utah came, uh, what, what problem you're trying to solve, what you've done to try to deal with that problem, and tell us something about the process that you followed to get to where you are today? Sure. And I'm delighted to be here uh, and to be speaking with, with you all. It's, it's always a pleasure to be presenting with Anne and Bill and Rohan and you. Um, about five years ago, the Utah Supreme Court made a decision that um, we were going to make trying to narrow the access to justice gap a priority, that something had to be done. Uh, the first thing that we did is license paralegals, and we have the first cohort, very small, that started nine more last month. So. We're going to end up with, you know, if we're just looking at paralegals, 20 in two years, 210. Um, I'm here to tell you that we're looking beyond that. So we're now looking at licensing people that are getting their masters, one year masters 
um, in law school. I'd like to take that to the Supreme Court. Uh, working to build a bachelor's program in law uh, to allow those individuals as well to be able to represent individuals, to expand the categories that these folks can participate in, as well as to allow them to, to make argument. So really, you know, the first thing that we thought needs to go is this, this notion that only a lawyer can give legal advice. Um, that has to fundamentally change. The, the second goes to, to Bill's point about uh, not only imagining who can provide legal advice, but the legal system itself. I mean, we really need to take a large part of the blame. We built a set of rules. We built a system for jury trials that are going away, uh, for having represented parties. Um, you know, if you take a look at a courtroom and take a look at an operating room, um, the operating room from 100 years ago looks vastly different than the courtroom does. Um, and the rules really haven't changed. So the second thing was completely rebuild a platform in-house, an online dispute resolution platform that is robust enough to take into any area. And we're starting in small claims, um, but really rewrite the business rules. So, and by that, I mean, don't, we all know the old adage that if you take, you know, you take a bad set of rules and you apply technology, all you get is bad results faster. We employed a wild animal group to say, here, uh, you innovators, what should it look like? You know, we'll make the changes. You tell us what it should look like. And we have a greatly stripped down, simplified process um, that's really meant to, uh, to paraphrase Richard Sussman, yeah. right? The, the, the notion of, of uh, starting to think of law as, as a thing and not a place. Justice is a thing and, and, and not a place. And like Anne, we have these wide swaths of territory where people have to go for miles in order to get to their hearings, uh, have to arrange for childcare, what have you, and how much easier it would be if they could do it efficiently and easily from the comfort of their home, right? Uh, related to that is, is forms and putting everything online, letting them access that. The, the whole point of this is that there's not a pan, there's not a, you know, it's not a silver bullet. There's no magic cure. Um, you have to, we have to fundamentally reimagine the, the legal ecosystem. Um, and one of the things, and I think, you know, a critical step to that, it's not, uh, it, it's not the end all and beat all, but it is a necessary condition is regulatory reform. And to that end, we, like, like Arizona, have changed our Rule 5.4. Now, we're slightly different in that um, the, the licensing process is that you have to go through a sandbox. You, know, you make application to provide a non-traditional legal service or to have non-traditional providers provide traditional legal services or non-traditional legal services. We'll collect data. We'll evaluate it. Um, and if it's, you know, if it benefits the consumer, you're in and you no longer are, you're no longer conducting the unauthorized practice of law. So, but it's a data driven model rather than the prescriptive model that we currently use. Uh, we're up and running. Uh, the office is not quite fully staffed, but it will be shortly. Uh, we anticipate running this this sandbox for at least a couple of years and want to take our own advice about gathering data on its effect. Uh, is it making a difference? Is it helping? Uh, and if so, then, then expand it, you know, grow it from there. For those of our listeners who may not be familiar with the term regulatory sandbox, uh, I, I think of that as a controlled environment in which a change can be tested and evaluated before it's improved. So the process in Utah is that if someone has a new structure, uh, non-lawyer ownership of, of legal services that they want to test, uh, they get approval from the Supreme Court to try it out. Uh, and then for some specified period of time, uh, it controlled uh, to minimize harm to the, to the public. Uh, they get to test it, it's evaluated, and if it's approved, it then 
uh, comes out of the sandbox and is allowed to be implemented. Is, is that roughly accurate, Justice Simonis? I think, think legal FDA testing, right? I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's a pilot. It's a, it's, a, it's a not fancy term for piloting pilots. Tell us about the process by which you got to where you are in Utah. In many states, when changes like this are proposed, the bar is opposed to them, and they don't happen. Uh, but uh, you had your, the bar as a partner uh, with the Supreme Court in proposing these changes. Can you tell us how that came about and what you did to get public input beyond just input from the bar on the changes that you recently adopted? Sitting in a conference in Washington in 2018, uh, with me was the current bar president, John Lund, the Chief Justice of the Utah Supreme Court and some others. Uh, after hearing Jillian Hadfield speak, um, you know, the bar president, myself, the chief, were convinced that, that making these kinds of changes was necessary. That this was this terrific ideas that we need to pursue, but made it clear this wasn't happening without the bar. And having a real visionary like John Lund uh, lead your bar at the time, gave us an immense advantage, right? It was a letter from John's successor um, to the court that really got this, got this going. Now, that's not to say that, that later on, we did not face opposition from bar leadership uh, as that changed. Uh, opposition actually may be too strong a word, but, but some pushback. Uh, but without that initial investment from bar leaders who recognize that their obligation was to the public writ large um, and not to the bar, I don't know that this would have ever happened. Um, so they deserve an immense amount of, of, of credit for it. In terms of engaging the public, that's a tough one. Um, we took a slightly different approach than Arizona. Um, we went for the headlines. Well, we tried with all of these, you know, all the op-eds, all the, all the media that we could, but really getting media attention to get public attention, very difficult. So you, add, you still end up getting, by and large, input from lawyers, not from the public. Uh, now, we were lucky because we got to piggyback on, on Arizona's excellent efforts with regard to doing public polling and, and use that. We didn't have to recreate the will. So we got data that way. But I, I'm, I've been thinking about this for some time and think I have a few ideas for other states that are following about how better to engage the public, um, because I think that that's really key. But I think we need to be honest about the fact that, that no matter what we do, the lawyers are going to have the loudest voice and that we need to recognize that. And that by and large, around about two to one, they're going to be opposed to these ideas. Um, and we need to understand that. Right? They're, when you're, they, I think, wrongly perceive their, their profession as being threatened by this. Um, and that's where the motivation is coming from. Yes. But, but your court approved these changes, notwithstanding the fact that the lawyers who commented were two to one against them. Unanimously. Yes. Yeah, unanimously. I mean, I think the court understands both the likelihood that those opposed are going to be the principal voices. Um, the, the bar commission itself was supportive. Uh, I think that anybody that seriously thinks about this issue comes to the same conclusion. There are a few naysayers, um, but honestly, we all understand that, that we have been sliding backwards in America in terms of access and affordability to civil justice in a huge way over the last decade. Um, and we can't just continue to ignore it uh, and pretend that, that, you know, as you've heard me say so many times, we can volunteer ourselves across the gap. That's never going to happen ever. Um, and we're never going to give legal services corporations and these other entities the type of resources they need um, to manage the gap or alter not only the, the resources, but the freedom, right? Because they're limited to what portion of the population they can actually serve. The gap is, is just 
Justice Timmerman suggested, isn't limited to those at 125% of, of the poverty level or lower. It runs all the way up the economic totem pole. Something yeah. else has to be done. So your experience with uh, lawyers and public comment in Utah is typical. Uh, I'm working with a research assistant at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, Francisco Torres, who looked at the comments submitted in Arizona, Utah, and uh, recently in California for proposed changes there. And what his research showed was that the, uh, the overwhelming majority of people who comment are lawyers, but only a very, very small percentage of the lawyer population in the state participates in the comment process. The majority of lawyers oppose change. When the public comments, uh, the majority of the public, uh, by a considerable margin, favors change. Uh, I, yeah. I think that's a very interesting dynamic. You can see from the poll that Justice Justice Timberman referred to, 80.2% 80, 80 um, favored non-lawyer legal advice, over 60% almost, right? Uh, favor alternative business structures. Once they're educated, even slightly educated about the advantages it offers, you get overwhelming public support. Now, harnessing that, getting them to express it more often, that, that's, that's the trick. And I also, I also completely agree with this notion that it's just a very small number of lawyers. The bar sent out a survey, um, and I in Utah, and I believe 70% of the lawyers that responded, uh, despite two years of efforts, countless articles, speaking at every opportunity, um, hadn't heard about it or didn't care about it. Let's turn to Rohan. Rohan, you have uh, first person experience with how the regulatory system can affect an innovator like yourself. Uh, can you describe what Upsolve is? Uh, what your experience uh, with the regulatory process has been, and uh, tell us your thoughts on the relationship between regulatory barriers and racial injustice. You recently had an op-ed about this uh, a few months ago that got uh, significant attention. So tell us what this looks like on the ground from your perspective as an innovator trying to make legal services available to people who don't have access to a lawyer. Of course, so uh, my story begins when I was an undergrad at Harvard. I was spending a lot of time at Harvard Law School's access to justice lab, helping low-income people who couldn't afford lawyers get access to um, assistance through self-help packets. So we were working on these self-help packets for people who are in need of bankruptcy, who are in need of responding to civil debt collection uh, lawsuits, and this was the first time that I was exposed to this problem that uh, if you can't afford uh, a lawyer in America, oftentimes you don't have the same rights as everyone else. And to me, this actually drew a lot of parallels to uh, uh, what black people in America had to face when trying to vote before the civil rights movement. Uh, the fees that people today have to pay lawyers in order to access their basic civil legal rights resemble in many ways poll taxes. If you can't afford the fee in order to afford your legal right, you can't afford that right. In the same way, when you couldn't afford to pay poll taxes, you couldn't afford your right to vote. And the complicated legal forms that so many people have to fill out in order to access their rights are very similar, in my mind, to literacy tests that used to exist. They used to stop people from accessing their vote, uh, their, their right to vote. So, with these paper packets that we were working on, I was inspired to see ways to scale these paper packets that were helping people solve their own legal problems through software. And um, my, the, the first thing I did was for a year with a co-founder who is a bankruptcy attorney, set up a brick and mortar legal aid uh, 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 office out of the Robin Hood Foundation. And he would help low income folks who come into our office in Brooklyn file for bankruptcy. And this is when I was exposed to one of the, uh, uh, the, the whole issue of, of regulation within the legal profession. And I learned that uh, if we wanted to create some sort of uh, a sustainable organization, um, uh, helping people 
by charging them some fee in order to review their forms, uh, that that wasn't allowed. That if, if you provided a service, you had to do it from beginning to end in bankruptcy and then unbundled legal services weren't permitted um, for, for law firms or for lawyers. Uh, uh, and, and to me, that was when I uh, saw firsthand um, that there were barriers that were stopping people from accessing legal services because they couldn't access unbundled services that were um, lower in expense than full representation. And uh, that, that was disheartening, um, but uh, at Upsolve, the way that we um, uh, navigated it is moving pure towards technology to help people um, solve their, uh, uh, or access bankruptcy if they have uh, no asset case and a very simple case um, using software, much like they would use TurboTax in order to assemble their forms. So using our software to fill out their forms on their own. Um, uh, uh, but I could foresee uh, in an alternative world with more um, openness, uh, there being a whole slew of solo bankruptcy practitioners who already have a hard time making it by um, uh, accessing a whole market um, that they're currently not able to address because they have um, these uh, rules in place. So the analogy to racial justice to me is or comes down to how much uh, access people have to our legal system. And fundamentally, I think UPL and UPL reform is an issue that isn't niche, isn't about uh, just the legal profession, but is fundamental to the American democracy. It's about how much justice people can get. And the current UPL rules guarantee that we don't have equal access to justice because they guarantee that the supply is less than the demand for help. So the only way in America to move forward and give people across this country access to justice is to provide uh, more supply of helpers available and to open up who can provide that assistance like Justice Timonia and Justice Timmer have done in, in their states. This is a Legal Services Corporation podcast. The Legal Services Corporation exists to fund legal aid lawyers. Uh, many uh, people in the legal profession are concerned uh, that authorizing people other than lawyers, uh, paraprofessionals, even if they're licensed and regulated, is going to create a two-tier justice system, second-class justice, where rich people will get what they sometimes call a real lawyer, and poor people will get half a lawyer. And that what we'll be doing is enshrining a system uh, in which people without means uh, get uh, less effective legal assistance than people who do have means. Uh, what is your answer to, to that? And, but, and their solution is, we need civil Gideon. Uh, what we need is funding for a lawyer for everyone with a significant civil legal problem. Uh, have you heard that objection? Uh, and what is your response to it? I'd love to um, chime in. Uh, so I certainly believe uh, civil Gideon, if it was practical uh, and uh, accessible and possible, um, uh, would be a great thing. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that uh, uh, civil Gideon for every single area of the law is a possibility. I do like what some states and cities have done where for particularly vulnerable uh, issues like um, housing and eviction in New York, there is a form of civil Gideon where you are guaranteed a right to counsel and I think that that's a great thing. Um, when I hear half a lawyer, um, the, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, uh, that uh, pe the people who make that claim don't recognize or maybe don't fully appreciate that licensed professionals who focus on one area of the law and do the same thing day in and day out can be more qualified and can provide a higher degree of assistance than a lawyer who's just graduated from law school and has no background in a specific area of the law, but is allowed to practice several different areas of the law. 
So uh, when I ask myself, who do I prefer to do my taxes, an accountant who has training and isn't a lawyer but specializes in uh, uh, telling me what's exempt, um, I, I think that I prefer an accountant over a lawyer. And I think for other areas of the law, something similar could be possible. Uh, the second thing is to recognize that we already have a severe tragedy in America where there are two tiers of justice right now. There's a tier of justice where you can get help and there's a tier of justice when you can't get help. So I think that when people propose uh, that paraprofessionals will lead to two tiers of justice, they're ignoring what we already have in America today. I, I agree with 90% of, of what Rohan had to say. Uh, sure, it would be great to have civil, civil Gideon um, for a lot of cases, but when you say not practical, I assume what you mean, and maybe it's 100% if we have this understanding, that some cases just don't deserve a lawyer. Right? Becky Sandifer in, in some of her landmark work said, everybody deserves legal advice, but not every case needs a lawyer. You know, if 75% if of civil judgments are worth $5,200 or less, it's really hard to justify having um, what I've described as the legal equivalent of a thoracic surgeon go to work on it. It just doesn't make any economic sense. Um, so what people read, what they're entitled to is legal advice, legal help. Um, sometimes people practicing at the top of their license as a lawyer, sometimes, sometimes not. The, the second is, I completely agree this notion that we're already tiered um, and that you need to benchmark um, the advice people are getting now in these areas, which is often zero, compared to what they would get. So that even if you were to buy in to this, uh, and I will call it nonsense, that you're gonna have that lawyer, that individuals who aren't lawyers are means that some of these individuals are getting second tier representation. Even if you were to buy into that, it's still better than, you know, 100 to zero, uh, if we're 100 to 50. But to Ron's point, that notion that, that those individuals are less qualified in specific areas is just not true and is undercut by the data. And my favorite study is, is the one out of the UK looking at representation by non-solicitors in landlord tenant, in debt collection, family law, medical matters, right? And finding a the error rate between them and solicitors that's equal at about 20%. Um, but that the non-solicitors were 600, 600%, six times more likely to be ranked excellent. Why? Exactly for why Ron laid, laid out. That's all they do. You know, towards the end of my litigation career, I undertook a, a, a family law case. My first uh, for a friend, practicing friend in family law. What a mistake, right? How much better off that individual would have been to have been served um, by somebody charging $70 an hour that, that has been practicing in the area of, of family law for 20 years and done nothing else. It's just, it, it, I, I just utterly reject the notion that these individuals are providing second rate services um, and think it's a lot of hubris on behalf of attorneys to make that claim. I also, Jim, we talked a little bit about the racial element. And when I hear the claim of half a lawyer, the first thing that comes to mind um, when I first heard that is how this country was founded with one group of people calling another group of people three-fifths of a person. And when you think about the legal profession and who disproportionately has access to it and who disproportionately doesn't have access to right. spend $200,000 and three years of uh, schooling, um, it's, it's clear to me that uh, the people who say half lawyer, um, there's some degree of white supremacy in that comment, I feel. I, I completely agree with it. everything that Rohan and, and Justice Amonis uh, said. Well, I add to it, one of your questions, Jim, was did we get any objection along those lines? I didn't hear any objection along mm -hmm. those lines. Uh, in our task force work or, or otherwise. Uh, and perhaps part of it is because the need is, people out here recognize the need, the need is so unmet. 
-hmm. and the areas that we are really focusing on, you don't see lawyers for the most part, except for family law, you don't see lawyers in administrative proceedings in uh, misdemeanor criminal offenses that have no jail time involved in administrative proceedings in small small debts, uh, creditor debtor disputes, that kind of a thing. So there is no one there uh, to meet the need. Yet my last point is that when you say half a lawyer, it reminds me of my uh, of my husband. Actually, he was a, a lifelong, for the most part, criminal criminal public defender. And of course, you get those kinds of, of, of allegations all the time. Oh, I don't want a criminal, a, a criminal public defender. I want a real lawyer, one that you have to pay a lot for. And so I've always been sensitive to, to, um, to that issue and thinking, frankly, I don't have the public defender who does this kind of like a DUI day in, day out, nearly knows what they're doing rather than the high price lawyer who maybe does one, two, three a year kind of thing. So. I think Justice Simonis is right. When you are focused particular subjects and requiring expertise within that area, you're you're better off in many instances uh, than having maybe a, maybe someone a more generalist practitioner. Thank you, Bill. You get the last word. The uh, 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 I I think that the legal profession has been so uh, uh, insulated because of the the, the investment rule and balkanized because the uh, because the justice system really is, is, is 50 different jurisdictions plus the federal jurisdiction, but kind of the people law problems are, are, are spread out around 50 different jurisdictions. And if you compare that, you know, to uh, the healthcare system, we're talking about, uh, oh, you're gonna get substandard care because these people who have less education are gonna come in and take care of the uh, ordinary people. I mean, you know, uh, 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 only one out of 10 people has a DO or an MD and, and, and healthcare. You don't want a doctor drawing blood on you. Uh, you don't want a doctor dealing with your respiratory care issues. You don't want them taking x-rays of you. Uh, and we have an entire credentialing system uh, that, that where, the, the, where the doctors have worked together uh, and created, uh, and with allied professionals and created this incredibly complex but effective system of education and credentialing where you can push these things down, done at a very high level, very cost effectively, very high quality control with people that, uh, that, that have bachelor's degrees or associate degrees or vocational training. And uh, this worshiping with the idea that a Harvard Law degree and, and, a, and a bunch of extra IQ points, it really doesn't matter when you're trying to do focused areas of, of law here. We just need somebody competent. Justice Jimenez was exactly right to point to that UK study here. Uh, a focused, specialized person who cares can get the job uh, done here. Combined with technology, and we're 80% of the way there. Well, thank you all. Uh, a few takeaways of my own. Uh, first, several of you have uh, noted the importance of accompanying regulatory reform with process simplification. You currently need a lawyer to do too, too much. The system does not need to be as complicated as, yeah. it, as it is. Uh, second, uh, I think we see in Justice Simonis and Justice Timmer the importance of leadership and leadership from the judiciary on these issues. Things happened in Utah and in Arizona because the Supreme Courts of those states recognized their responsibility to do something about improving access to justice. They saw the relationship between the prior regulatory system and barriers to justice. They took the bull by the horns and they addressed it. And Justice Amonis and Justice Timmer in particular, two individuals who, who led the charge. So if you wanna see change, we need champions uh, like Justice Simonis and, and Justice Timmer. Uh, and finally, we need to enable and empower people like Rohan. Um, Rohan is 24. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Rohan is a hero of mine, and I, I think he is doing something really concrete and exemplary to improve uh, access to justice. We don't want to be putting roadblocks in front of, of people like Rohan Pavaluri. So uh, thank you all uh, for a, an enlightening presentation on how regulatory reform can improve access to justice. Until uh, the next Talk Justice. Thank you.
Podcast guest speakers' views, thoughts, and opinions are solely their own and do not necessarily represent the Legal Services Corporation's views, thoughts, or opinions. The information and guidance discussed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice. You should not make decisions based on the podcast content without seeking legal or other professional advice.